Hi, I'm Rebecca Tabor Conover. Welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. Thank you. But we're glad to have you here at the Old State House, and I'd love to show you the front of our beautiful building. This is a federal style building, and it was uh, completed over three years, started in 1793, finished in 1796. And you can see the materials that were used um, are brick and also uh, Portland brownstone from right here in Connecticut. And for 82 years, beginning in 1796 up through 1878, this was one of the state capitals here in Hartford until the new state capital was constructed and it was moved there. But then the building was used for about 35 years as the um, city hall for Hartford. In college, I um, studied uh, history, but I also took classes in uh, historic preservation, which talked about museums and archaeology and architecture. And that's really what led me to a career in museums because I love the history, but I also like sharing that history with people and uh, seeing how it's relevant. And here at the Old State House, we really are working very hard to make sure that we don't just talk about what happened in the past, but we see people of the past um, as models for civic engagement for people of today. But you know, one of the things that's great about working here is so many people, um, Connecticut has such a rich history and the Old State House really has been at the hub of Connecticut's history since it's Hartford's founding 375 years ago. And so helping citizens and also visitors just become more familiar with just the richness of our history. And what happened in this particular building um, is a lot of fun. And so it makes coming to work every day a joy to come to work. This is actually a Lego version of the old State House. Folks at Lego Company very kindly brought this display back to the old State House about a year ago. And it's a really great teaching tool for our younger visitors. It's one of their favorite items um, that they see here because they can relate to the Legos, but they also can see the entire building up close. I'd like to bring you down to the Mortensen Gallery, which I think you'll enjoy seeing. Sure. Um, and this exhibit down here is called Histories All Around Us. And it was done by the Connecticut Historical Society, who was running the building at the time, created this wonderful exhibit called Histories All Around Us. And it really talks, it focuses on Hartford, but it talks about how um, we as people contribute to history and how in our daily lives we encounter history. Um, and uh, it's a great way to really become familiar with the city. And for younger visitors, we always have a scavenger hunt available that they can participate in. And um, that makes it a fun way to explore um, the exhibit. But it's a very interactive exhibit. History is all around us just in terms of uh, even street names, for instance, the asylum, um, which was uh, based on the asylum for, for what was called the Asylum for the Deaf and Dumb because the first um, school for uh, the deaf was founded here in Hartford. And probably one of the best ways to really understand how the fabric of the city changed is this activity, which is called Build Hartford. You can look at various maps and then um, use blocks and uh, put them on the map and see how uh, Hartford changed over time, especially the area around the old State House from the 1640s, right after Hartford's founding, up through um, today. This bike that belonged to Mark Twain, there's a reproduction one in which you can climb on to see what it's like um, and to experience that, and that's always really fun. Fire truck is another of the big and literally big <laughs> items here, um, but it dates from 1912 and it was used by the Hartford Fire Department. Now this is a reproduction or is this an original? This is an original. It is, it is an original um, and it was used by the fire company. It was called a pumper, um, but it was used by the fire company here in Hartford. And this is all interactive? It is, enjoy. yep, absolutely. Um, we have school groups that we do scavenger hunts with or focus on um, Hartford's development. Um, but the Connecticut Historical Society did a really great job of pulling this exhibit together. This is the courtroom. Various courts, including the Supreme Court of Errors, met in this room. And there were a lot of important cases held here. The opening trials to the Amistad uh, trial were actually held both in this room and the Senate. And also the court case associated with uh, Prudence Crandall that eventually ended up at the Supreme Court of Errors was held in this room as well. And looking up, you can see the balcony where spectators could watch the proceedings. Various courts met here, including the Supreme Court of Errors, 
but also Hartford City Court and the County Court. We're going to go upstairs to see the legislative chambers that are located here. But first, let's stop at uh, the Statue of Justice. Lady Justice used to be on top of the building. Today, what you see is a reproduction, a fiberglass reproduction of her. But she was placed on top of the cupola in 1827. And um, the statue is a, a form that's probably familiar to a lot of people because it's still used on courthouses today. This is the Senate chamber, and it was used um, to house the upper chamber of the General Assembly. Um, the room really f reflects what a federal style meeting room would have looked like, and much of the furniture in this room is original. Um, yellow was a really popular color at that time, and then um, you'll notice the shield back chairs and the um, inlay on the furniture, again, very typical of the federal style. Probably the highlight of this room is this original painting of George Washington that was done by Gilbert Stuart. Two of the opening uh, hearings for the Amistad trial were held in this building because one was going on in the courtroom at the time, the other one was held here in um, the Senate chamber. So Ron, thank you for taking us in here. Yeah, this is the old House of Representatives chamber. This is, um, you had the legislative hall on this level, you had the Senate and the House on this side. But the restoration of this room is representing a later time period. You notice the difference in style. You have the federal style and here you have the Victorian style. So you have uh, fancy carpeting and draperies, stenciling and that kind of thing. So this was where the city council met. This building was city hall from 1879 to 1915. And uh, you see a different setup entirely from the, from the Senate. You see uh, desks and these desks and chairs uh, all date back to around the 1870s and they were actually used by the city council when the city met here up until 1915. And uh, the room is, the restoration of the room is based on that period. Now there are some famous people you may have heard of that served here. Have you ever heard of Noah Webster? I have. Uh, Web Father of the American Dictionary. He served in this room about 200 years ago. Wow. Uh, P.T. Barnum uh, from circus fame. Before he was a, uh, before he was a, or before he was a, uh, a showman, he was a politician. Uh, right after the Civil War, he served four terms as a member of the House of Representatives. So Ron, I hear there's a third room on this floor. Yes, uh, Stewart's Hartford Museum, my favorite room in the entire building, right, right in here. Now, what is this? This is called Stewart's Hartford Museum. And Joseph Stewart was a portrait artist. And he was allowed to use space in this building starting in 1796. Mm -hmm. But alongside his portraits, he started to add natural history items. And basically anything that was not native to Connecticut was absolutely fascinating to people. So it was oddities, curiosities, and this is where people came to learn about natural history. I mean, this was all that was really available. I and mean, think about what's available now, National Geographic and all that, but this is where people came 200 years ago to learn about natural history. Joseph Stewart had a two-headed calf he advertised in 1804, along with the two-headed pig. And this was actually acquired in 1996 from a dairy farm in Sheboygan, Michigan. And it made the headlines. And the director here was looking for a two-headed calf to complete the collection here. And he was able to find this and purchase it for display. And it's probably the most popular thing in the entire museum, in the entire building, probably the most popular attraction in the entire building. This two-headed pig, um, Mr. Stewart advertised one also in the year 1804. Um, very unusual, two fully formed heads, one perfect body. And you were saying this is the only, the only place to have two two-headed animals. As far as from the research I've done, the only place I know in the entire world that's right now displaying two fully formed two-headed mammals right now. There's some things that have snakes and different things, yeah. but we have that, I don't know, infamous distinction, <laughs> I guess, of having two two-headed mammals currently on display. That's incredible. The only place you'll find it anywhere in the world right now, believe it or not. Okay, now Ron, I thought this was a monkey paw, but apparently it's a human hand. It's actually a human hand. It's a person's left hand. Um, I believe the thumb is missing on it. But no, it's not a monkey paw. It's actually the only human item on display here in the museum. But it's a person's left hand, uh, supposedly thousands of years old. It's darkened with age and kind of shrunken. But uh, yeah, we even have a human hand on display. This is actually a narwhal tusk or okay. tooth they're sometimes called. Only the males have 
this tusk like this. This is a pretty large one, it's about five feet high. But um, often during the time of Stewart's Museum 200 years ago, these were passed off as unicorn horns. <laughs> so, you know, people weren't all that familiar with what narwhals were. They still aren't in a lot of cases, but um, these were often displayed um, by unscrupulous uh, museum uh, proprietors, which Joseph Stewart was not one of those. But these were often displayed as unicorn horns. Okay, now we have an alligator, it looks like. Yeah, this is the one item here. If you look at his eye, he will follow you anywhere you go in the room. It works very well with school kids. That is very But you know, if you stand over there, his eye's on you. But at any rate, this alligator is 8 feet 9 inches long. And uh, he's from Florida, and he was, he was captured by the Wildlife Commission there, as I understand. Now, one thing that's overlooked about Mr. Stewart sometimes is that he was a portrait artist. That was his, that was his livelihood for the most part, especially early on until this curiosity collection got to be so popular. But these are some of, the, some of his original portraits that uh, were actually on display in his museum when it was housed here. So some of these paintings were actually on display with his curiosities. So you could imagine, if you could imagine um, 200 years ago, seeing things like this for the first time. It must have just been just astonishing to people. Because if you were lucky, maybe you had books with illustrations, if you were wealthy. But uh, and if you traveled the world, maybe you'd have access to things like this sometimes. But to actually see these all kind of in one place like this must have just been fascinating to people. And this is where people came to learn about history. This is, you know, curiosity meant intellectual discovery. So it wasn't just seeing wild things with two heads, it was actually learning about the world around you.